today we have a lecture by Professor Bruno Salama, our dear colleague from Fundação Getúlio Vargas, Direito São Paulo. Bruno is a senior global fellow at Fundação Getúlio Vargas Law School in São Paulo, where he previously served as a law professor. He's also a lecturer at the UC Berkeley Law School Legal Studies Program, where he has taught law and economics 102, monetary law and regulation, law and development, and the law and technology. He's founding partner of Salama Silva Filhos Advogados, a Brazilian for law firm, where he consults in several areas of law and work in, in arbitrations. He has practiced law in New York uh, uh, with uh, Sullivan and Croyle uh, LLP and in Sao Paulo with Pinheiro Neto de Vogatos. And he is admitted uh, before the New York State and the Brazilian bars. He has been a visiting professor at Columbia University Law School in New York and at Beijing Jiatongi University Law School in China. He has also been in a government as a member of Brazilian National Financial System and Appeals Council. He has recently uh, named to the Global Bank Regulation Reviews 45 and the 45 specialists. He holds a uh, doctor in law and a master's in economics. And, uh, by overview, he's a good friend of us. Thank you so much, Bruno. And they would like to please uh, give the, the, the word. Thank you so much again. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. I'm here to talk about empirics in law and economics, but I'm not going to explain empirical methods or present uh, the most recent results in the literature. My endeavor here is a little bit different. <clears throat> I wish to, I wish to discuss uh, uh, how we should understand uh, empirical work in the context of the law and economics literature. The turn to empirical methods in law and econ would seem to suggest that the field is maturing, as I will explain to you, into what we could call normal science in a Kuhnian sense, and I will explain what I mean by that. Perhaps the deep theoretical questions that have once haunted the field uh, have now been solved and the scholars can and should simply turn to the applied and empirical problems. However, I find that not to be the case. Some of the old questions have never been adequately solved and new ones have emerged in the literature, particularly as we will see after the great crisis of 2008. For instance, as I will detail later on, the coming about of a field of law and macroeconomics on which I have published, uh, the critique levered by Mariana Pargendler against what she calls modularity in law and econ, a much greater concern with inequality alongside efficiency among many others. These are all very pressing questions in the literature, questions which cannot be simply answered by resorting to empirics. In this class, I will therefore conclude that the breadth of publications in law and economics seems to suggest that there is forward moving, that there is progress, but that a closer look, as I will argue, the field has not and probably never will simply mature as normal science. This is for sure not to deny the importance of conducting empirical work, 
but to caution against overselling the achievements of law and econ. Something that I seem to, that I think is very common amongst scholars in the field. So that's my presentation in a nutshell. We think, or we would like to think that the field has matured, that there is great progress, that we're just doing normal science now, that we're dealing with empirical and applied questions. And as it turns out, the deep theoretical questions have never been settled. That's what I will share with you today. Now, let me start here with um, a very interesting paper published uh, about a decade ago by one of the founding fathers of the field, Robert Cooter, who teaches uh, here at Berkeley. Um, his thesis in the paper was that empirical research means that law and econ is maturing into normal science. And as I explained, I will question that. Is the field really maturing into normal science? Well, to answer that, the first thing we have to do is to ask ourselves, what is normal science? Thomas Kuhn, the famous uh, theoretician, distinguished two types of science, normal science and revolutionary science. Normal science, he tells us, happens under the auspices of a broad set of unquestioned assumptions, which he famously termed the paradigm, by the way, introducing the term into popular culture. The paradigm is just what we don't question. And therefore we work on the, uh, on, not on the underlying questions, but rather on the applied questions that fit into this paradigm. How do we do that? Well, hypothesis can be deduced from current theory, from the underlying assumptions that are shared by everybody and unquestioned and remain unquestioned. And then this hypothesis can be tested empirically. And the goal, of course, in normal science is to carry out incremental imp uh, improvements. Therefore, to detail the paradigm in place, which rests unquestioned. Now, of course, science evolves uh, when uh, there are the results come up, many will confirm the underlying paradigm, but others will, will uh, uh, not perfectly fit into that. And as normal science proceeds, therefore, unexplained anomalies accumulate, results that do not fit the existing paradigm and which therefore prompt the coming about of revolutionary science, which then questions the paradigm and eventually replaces it by something else, right? And this, is a, this, uh, this uh, figure can sort of represent this idea of a shifting paradigm. Let's say you look at the figure here, you look at the image here, and you see a bird, right? And so everybody is working under the assumption that this is a bird. And so you're gonna study the bird, you're gonna test hypotheses, how the birds behave, what they do, and so on and so forth until at some point someone is going to come and say, hold on a second, is this really a bird? And then we'll ask the more fundamental question, well, perhaps this is not a bird, but rather a rabbit. And so if you take your time to look at this uh, image for a second, you will notice that probably at first you see a bird, and then at closer look, if you spend a few minutes or a few seconds looking at it, you will see the rabbit, right? The question as to whether this is a bird or a rabbit is the paradigmatic question, right? It is the revolutionary question. It is the question that deals with the fundamentals, okay? 
Now, what would be normal science in law and econ? This, this idea of operating under an umbrella, under a given umbrella, the umbrella of the prevalent paradigm. I will say that it basically uh, uh, can be summarized as follows. So what is the endeavor of law and econ? It is to apply economics to legal questions, but not any kind of economics, but rather microeconomics and very specifically mainstream microeconomics, the microeconomics that you find in uh, introductory textbooks. And so the goal is to apply macroeconomics to law with a view to producing an economic theory of law. That was the goal, by the way, set out by those who started research in law and econ some 50 years ago, maybe even more, depending on where you set the beginning of the discipline. And why? Why create, what is, let me ask it like this, what is it and to talk about an economic theory of law? What would it be an economic theory of law? It has, it has two dimensions. We can refer to the first one as a positive dimension. It is to explain the law as it is. It is therefore a descriptive endeavor. The idea is to use the concepts that you find in microeconomics, incentives, equilibrium, supply, demand, prices, elasticities, and so on and so forth. And therefore used all these uh, conceptual framework which constitutes microeconomics and then apply it to law to make sense of the law. And so the goal uh, here is uh, to frame the law, is to establish an explanatory theory of the law as it is. The second aspect of an economic theory of the law would be to use economics to provide a basis, hopefully a solid one, solid meaning a trustworthy one, for criticizing and reforming the law. And so here the endeavor is no longer one of making sense of the law as it is, right? And therefore considering that the law evolved in a such in a such uh, away uh, because, you know, legislators and courts and judges were all responding to incentives. And so there's a certain opportunity set uh, that implicitly drives the players in the game of law uh, to frame the law in a certain fashion such that the law evolves like this or like that. That's not what the normative aspect of uh, this uh, uh, endeavor, uh, the endeavor to find an economic theory of the law is. The idea here rather is to, is to come up with ideas, to come up with ideas to improve the law and therefore to be able to say things like, well, if you interpret this, the law in this way, but not in that way, you will create perverse incentives. The consequences are undesirable. And so ultimately what we find here is the idea uh, that you can use economics to make the law more efficient. This was the game plan for law and economics for the get-go to create an economic theory of the law. And therefore, let me repeat, to use economics to make sense of the law and also to use economics to improve the law. And so normal science in law and econ would just be uh, the, the continuing this endeavor, uh, but the, come, the development of new techniques uh, of empirical research would have simply normalized 
the endeavor that I am describing to you such that by resorting to these new techniques, the scholars operating in the tradition or the paradigm of law and econ could avoid very, very tough theoretical questions that come about once someone sets himself or herself in the path of trying to figure out the economic theory of the law, as I have just described to you. Now, let me give you, let me give you um, a, a, a very, very, very abridged version of what law and economics has done in the past several decades while operating under uh, this uh, premises that I have just discussed with you. The, the, while uh, law and econ uh, certainly have, has had a lot of uh, uh, promoters and uh, scholars who laid the foundations for it, no one has made more for the development of law and economics than Richard Posner. And this is a picture I found on Google of the young Posner. And what was his original project, as far as I can tell from, his read, from reading his work, especially his early work? First of all, first of all, uh, uh, Posner came up with a theory that can be can be thought of as a historical theory, as an exercise in history. In the following way, Posner presented to his audience a hypothesis. The hypothesis that the common law, particularly the US common law, had evolved towards efficiency. And so to ground his claim, he, he conducted a tour de force, which is just brilliant and gigantic, and I fall short of, uh, of uh, uh, adjectives uh, to transmit to you the awe uh, that I uh, feel when I look at uh, the path that has been accomplished by this genius. Um, because in order to ground his hypothesis, the hypothesis that the US common law had evolved towards efficiency, meaning of course, right, that the law was improving such that it was every time giving better incentives to, for people to coordinate with one another, particularly in a market setting, right, with a view to fostering uh, cooperation, but also uh, other things such as uh, efficient breaches of contracts and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, and many other things. And so in order uh, to ground his uh, hypothesis, right, what Posner did was carry out an economic analysis of a, a huge spectrum of uh, fields in, in the uh, US common law. Uh, and in every instance, in every instance, Posner could share with his readers uh, explanations for why the law as it is, even when this is not obvious, is giving incentives for efficiency uh, to the people that are under the jurisdiction of such laws. Now, my understanding of his scholarship is that at some point in the 70s, uh, in the late 70s, particularly when Posner comes across antitrust law, he starts to move from a positive law and economics into a normative law and economics. So Posner is more or less asking the following question. He's basically saying, hold on a second. I've studied contract law. I've studied property law. I've studied tort law. I've studied some regulation. <clears throat> I've studied constitutional law. And I find many instances where the US common law seems to be improving, therefore becoming more efficient. 
But when I get to antitrust, I am a little bit dissatisfied with the status quo in the field. And so I will propose, I will propose that in antitrust law, efficiency, efficiency understood alongside the, the mainstream in microeconomics as increasing the welfare of consumers sh that should become the normative goal for antitrust law. I think I said a very long sentence. Let me say that again. Poser comes across antitrust law and he is not very satisfied with what he sees because he thinks that antitrust law is often not giving incentives for efficiency, but he thinks that the law ought to be efficient. So notice the step from positive to normative. It is one thing to say, well, you know, the common law evolved towards efficiency and therefore we're more or less pleased with the law as it is. Maybe we want to improve it here or there, but we're pretty much satisfied with what we see. However, in antitrust, it is creating very bad incentives from a cost perspective. But I think that antitrust law ought to be efficient. And so I'm proposing that the law should change, that antitrust law should change. Now, when he does that, he is being a normativist rather than one who is simply theorizing on the status quo. And from that, in the early 80s, Posner moves to writing uh, a book called uh, uh, The Economics of Justice. It's published in, I think, the first edition in 1981 or 1983, or maybe there's the first edition in 81 and the second in 83 or something like that. And then Posner proposes that efficiency should be the ethical norm. He says, not necessarily everywhere in the world. I'm not totally sure He's, he shares with his readers, but at least in the US, at least in the US, efficiency is a wonderful goal and we should follow it. And so efficiency is used in a very different way rather than simply being used as an analytical to, to describe the situation, it becomes a normative criterion. A law is desired or an interpretation of the law is desired to the extent that it promotes efficiency. And with those two legs that you find very clearly in Posner's uh, work, especially up until the late 80s, the original project of law and econ is in some ways, I would claim, finalized, right? So we wanna make sense of the US common law. And we do that by using economics. And Posner has a theory that is historical. He suggests it's evolving towards efficiency. But he also proposes, he also proposes that efficiency should be the normative goal for the law moving forward. Okay. Now, then, then there's the there's a, a, a Posner's scholarship is uh, uh, empirical in a in a in a more uh, modest sense, right? Because he is looking at cases. Well, in that respect, you could say it's empirical, right? He's not talking pure abstraction. He's talking about decisions by the courts. He comments cases. He talks about the evolution of the law. But when we use, especially economists, when economists use empirical, the word empirical, uh, they mean something completely different, right? What they mean is using empirics to test hypotheses, okay? In other words, to validate models or invalidate models, right? A model is basically uh, um, uh, a description of the world as it is. And it proposes that something is a function of something else. These are the endogenous variables. And these models can be tested, right? If I change something, if I change x, what is happening to f of x? That's a model. And it can be tested empirically and the preferred tool for doing that 
uh, within economists, uh, the economist profession is econometrics. And then there's, there are certain drivers uh, for uh, mostly, mostly economists, right, to start applying their toolkit to legal questions. The first driver, we can call it dissatisfaction. This, the, the first driver is simply that the first models that had been proposed by Richard Posner, but of course by many other scholars writing in the tradition of law and econ, did not, or at least very often, did not predict observed law. That's the first problem. Second, fields such as evolutionary economics and beha behavioral economics uh, were framed as improvements to the original models. And so while behavioral economics is in most ways at odds with microeconomics, uh, it was often framed as a small improvement to the models, and it makes sense to do that. It makes sense to do that, right? And so basically the idea is, okay, we're going to do supply and demand alongside uh, uh, the basic microeconomic models. But rather than using just this abstract idea of an homo economicus, right? This idea that, that, that individuals are maximizing their utilities and so on and so forth. We're going to do something slightly different. We're going to start looking for deviations from the basic model. And therefore, we're going to start looking for biases. But not simply any biases, but rather biases that reflect systematic deviations from the basic models, right? The behavioral economics makes sense to the extent, of course, that it does, because it is not proposing simply that people are irrational. The idea of in behavior economics is a little more sophisticated than that. It's not that people are irrational, but rather that they are slightly irrational in a systematic fashion. And because they are irrational in a systematic fashion, we can try to model their behaviors, just taking into account this small tweak to the original model, the bias. That is the basic idea in behavioral economics. And this, uh, uh, an evolutionary economics, which is basically, to be technical here, endogenization of preferences, and I'm not going to get there because I don't have time, um, but the idea, the idea is that Okay, Th this uh, uh, evolutionary economics and particularly behavior economics, a little bit game theory and a few other things, they're just minor improvements. They're minor, minor improvements uh, to the economic models. And we can continue. That's the crucial point. We can continue, we can continue our pursuit of an economic theory of the law just by improving a little bit our models, our, our mindset, and therefore incorporating evolutionary economics and behavioral economics. But above all, but above all, but above all, scholars are driven to empirics because of improvements in econometric techniques, but also more recently, the much greater availability of data. And so arguably, it is now a lot easier to test hypotheses. Much more can be done than used to be possible. And because you, we have this wealth of data and this, the and such amazing empirical techniques are available. We can forget complicated theoretical questions. We can focus on the paradigm. We're going to say the original paradigm. All we did is tweaking it a tiny bit. 
by adding evolutionary economics and behavioral economics. And now we still operate under the basic paradigm of law and econ. And we're going to focus on empirical challenges and applied questions. Now, by the way, let me just add a footnote here. Uh, it is a definitional question, right, as to whether the coming about of behavioral economics, evolutionary economics, game theory, and other things constitutes a paradigmatic change. But this is not really important because we are not here to discuss uh, 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 the essence of law and economics, right? Whether it's mainstream, old fashioned microeconomics, or whether it is microeconomics, let's say improved by newer techniques and so on and so forth. We're not concerned with that. We're concerned, we're concerned with a simple question. Let me try to restate it. Let me, let me try to restate it. The question is this. What is the game? What is the game in? I don't know if this is a, 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 a suitable expression in English. What is the game in town now in law in econ? Is it all about figuring out empirically, empirically, uh, 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 the the economic theory of the law, or rather, are there deep theoretical questions that have never been settled and are? Uh, still present in the literature, right? If you believe, if you believe that law and econ has now been normalized, normalized in the sense that the challenges are empirical and applied, uh, uh, then you're you're basically elevating, you're basically elevating empirics uh, to the center stage of law and econ, right? Uh, and therefore, the, the important work to be done in law and econ is empirical. And uh, theoretical work is uh, footnotes. Footnotes, not important. Okay? Now, I think that the turn, let me just look at the time. Yeah. I think that the turn to empirical methods in law and econ, which is palpable, it is happening. Right, there is ever more works, empirical works in law and econ. I think that this turn to empirical methods suggests that the law is maturing as normal science, right? I mean, it's the claim uh, with which I started my presentation, which is Bob Cooter's claim, right? The claim that law and econ has now matured into, social, into uh, normal science. Uh, uh, there's evidence for that. And therefore, perhaps the deep theoretical questions that have once haunted the field have now been solved. And accordingly, the main questions are applied and empirical. It sounds lovely. It sounds lovely because, you know, it means there's progress. We're moving forward. Law and econ is much better than it used to be. It just sounds amazing. Sadly, 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 it's not the case. And so my presentation today is a complete bummer. And the reason for that is that there are unsolved foundational questions in law and econ. Foundational questions that have not been abandoned, nor should they be abandoned. And I'm going to tell you this, just some of those, uh, I'm going to share with you just some of those unsolved foundational questions. And I'm going to do that threefold. First of all, I'm going to discuss with you the normative problems with efficiency. There's the old problem and then there is the new problem. Second, I'm going to talk a little bit about method in law and econ, and I'm going to ask two questions. First, which economics? And second, what methodological, methodological approach? And then finally, I'm going to talk about the founding fathers themselves and what they have written recently. 
And I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to do that in maybe 30 to 40 minutes. Hopefully I can accomplish that. So let's start with the normative problems with efficiency. As I said, I'm going to break them into the old problem and the new problem. Let's start with the old problem. Let's start with the old problem. Well, it all goes back to Richard Posner's economics of justice, right? His influential, controversial, and ultimately completely wrong book published in 1981 called uh, The Economics of Justice. His thesis that, uh, uh, that efficiency should be the key normative goal for law what he called the wealth maximization principle, right? The idea, therefore, the principle, therefore, that the goal of the law should be that of maximizing wealth, okay? Wealth, by the way, understood uh, as a, a term of art, not any wealth, right? But wealth understood in what, in the, in the theory, we, we would call the Marshallian sense. The Marshallian sense is uh, the, the theory of wealth that is embedded in the supply and demand models that you learn in microeconomics 101, right? The idea that if I pay 100 for something, but I'm willing to pay 130, the moment I buy it for 100, I am wealthier by $30, even if I paid $100, right? So what is this wealth? It's the utility that $30 provide to me, okay? Now, as it turns out, the idea that efficiency should be the guideline for law has been severely criticized. Posner spent the 1980s decade uh, playing... Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I don't have the word in English, uh, just um, like, uh, like with a sword, uh, fencing, fencing against his, uh, his cri uh, critics um, who were for a number of reasons saying that this idea was absurd, as I completely agree, it is absurd, right? What were those criticisms? The first one is that several liberties have intrinsic and not instrumental value. And so if it should be just to get uh, the argument to, the, to this, uh, to this logical, logical implication, right? If it should be that, for example, uh, enslaving a certain group or, or, uh, or, uh, um, or looting a certain group uh, or uh, discriminating a certain group, right? If it should be, that that would, in a way or another, uh, be efficient. Because, for example, you know, the gains from the majority are larger than the losses of the minority, right? If, should, if it should be that that would happen, that that were conceivable, uh, and that therefore uh, hurting a certain uh, fundamental liberty under the guise or the name of, or in the altar of efficiency, if that should happen, right, uh, uh, it, that would still not be acceptable because certain liberties have intrinsic rather than instrumental value, right? And of course, you could talk about rights and liberties as themselves having instrumental value. But the moment you do that, you're abandoning the wealth maximization principle. It's a different argument. It's still economic. Uh, you could say, you know, protecting private property, just to give you an example, um, fosters investment and is desirable. Um, but this is, a, and therefore you would think of the liberty to own property as, as economically valuable. But when you say that and frame it this way, it is different from making the specific calculation in terms of the wealth results of tweaking the law in each specific case. Second, the wealth maximization principle is insensible to the initial distribution of rights. 
And so if you want to think about uh, um, uh, maximizing wealth, uh, then uh, this, the, how we got here is irrelevant. All that matters is where we're going forward, which is an argument that I sympathize. I sympathize with this argument. However, you know, there are exceptions. Uh, elevating this idea beyond all others is dangerous, is dangerous. And I could, I could, I could give you examples, but uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm going to speak very more or less abstractly here since I need to cover a lot of ground. Uh, and, and let me give you an example. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say, let's say uh, a certain city, let's say a certain city uh, is uh, considering building a, an amusement park um, for kids. Okay, uh, is, do you call it? A playground, sorry, not an amusement park, a playground. And th this argument, uh, this example is not mine. You find it in the literature in a paper by um, um, uh, Zachary Liskow. Uh, and so Liskow shares with us the, the, the following example. Let's say the, the city is considering uh, building a playground for kids, right? And there's two options. You can build the playground in the poor uh, neighborhood or in the wealthy neighborhood. Now, obviously, obviously, the wealthy neighborhood would be willing to pay more for the playground. By the way, nobody's going to pay. This is, let's say, going to come all from taxes, right? It's tax money being used to build a playground. But where is the playground maximizing wealth as understood as willingness to pay, right? Which is the baseline for macro, microeconomics. Is it in the wealthy neighborhood or in the poor neighborhood? Now, obviously, willingness to pay is bigger in the rich neighborhood than in the poor neighborhood. And so efficiency would require that the city build the playground in the wealthy neighborhood. But that, but if you do that, that just seems... Uh, it, it might be inefficient, right? You could leverage a, uh, an economic critique to that. But the, the easier way uh, to criticize that would be to say this is completely unjust. And, uh, and so this idea of wealth maximization principle is completely insensible to the initial distribution of rights. And therefore, the argument is that wealth maximization the principle is just disguised utilitarianism. Because you see, uh, you, the utilitar what is utilitarianism? I mean, to say it, uh, to refer to a long tradition in one sentence, is basically the idea that the morality of action depends on the expected circumstances in terms of happiness, right? And so if something produces the happiness of the greatest number, thumbs up, if not, thumbs down. That's utilitarianism. Now, the idea, is that substituting the criterion Bentham's, right? The great utilitarian philosopher, Bentham's uh, utility and therefore happiness for a criterion of wealth would be more, more uh, 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 easier to manage, to calculate, and would basically avoid some of the monstrosities that the pure utilitarian calculus uh, could lead us into because utilitarianism could, in theory, you find that in the literature and make sense, could justify, uh, you know, extermination of a certain group, of course, right, for obvious reasons. And so people will say, well, you know, what Posner is doing here is disguised utilitarianism. And he countered this people by saying, well, but wealth uh, assumes that uh, uh, most things happen in a market and therefore they are Pareto efficient and so on and so forth. There's a complicated discussion I don't have time here to discuss with you, but basically it feels like utilitarianism, it smells like utilitarianism. Uh, it is a kind of utilitarianism. Now, I love another critique that was leveraged against uh, Posner, which is that it, his idea is impracticable. Because if economists have a hard time measuring outcomes in market, in explicit markets, right? If economists have a hard time predicting, you know, whether the dollar is going to go up or whether the dollar is going to go down, whether, whether oil is going up or going down, whether stocks are going up or going down and so on. 
how are they going to be able to measure right what's going to happen with crime if uh, sentences increase or decrease uh, if um, if uh, you know a principle in contract law is interpreted this way but not that way right i mean just think about that thinking about practical right let's say the principle of impracticability which exists uh, in the u.s uh, ucc uh, but uh, u.s courts don't like to to use it conversely in europe under other names uh, such as uh, basis of contract uh, as in uh, and, and as in Germany, Grundgeschäftslage, or or imprévision, as in France, or or uh, 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 you know there are other theories, right? But the the bottom line is the bottom line is that in most places in the world, right, a, a functional substitute to the doctrine of impracticability is employed all the time. Whereas in the US it's not. And so the incentive in the US is for people to devote more effort and spend more money detailing their contracts and writing long contracts to discuss you know, unforeseeable circumstances. Whereas in the, Euro in the continental law tradition, the European continental law tradition, uh, the incentive is for people to write shorter contracts because if unforeseeable circumstances come about, the courts will intervene and fix up the contracts, right? So which is superior? Uh, and it's not readily obvious. And these kinds of questions are just too hard, I would claim, for uh, empirical studies, uh, even though uh, new techniques could illuminate the problem. But it would always be under empirical uh, analysis, very tentative. And other people's, uh, Dworkin, for example, said, you know, efficiency is not a value, or if it is a value, then it's an abhorrent one, and so on and so forth. Bottom line, bottom line, in 1990, in 1990, Richard Posner writes a beautiful book, a uh, very clever book, one uh, that I uh, really love, and I've written about it, but in Portuguese, uh, called The Problem of Jurisprudence. And he basically says, he basically says, uh, he openly, sorry, not basically, he openly says, I'm changing my mind. I once uh, defended wealth maximization above other ethical norms. I no longer think along those lines. And so Posner goes back to the American tradition of pragmatism, uh, basically. And he says, well, you know, my kind of pragmatism has some elements of this and that. Uh, but then it's, you know, it's basically the US tradition, the tradition of pragmatism. So where are we now in this discussion about normative law and econ? Uh, Richard Posner's son, whom uh, this audience here might uh, have uh, met in person, uh, uh, Eric Posner, another uh, genius in, uh, in the, in the uh, tradition of law and econ, wrote just very recently a very short paper uh, that I liked very much called The Boundaries of Normative Law and Econ. And uh, what Eric Posner says basically, right, what he says is, you know, uh, 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 that uh, we, we should abandon, we should abandon the, the, the search for an overarching goal um, for law and econ, an overarching normative goal for law and econ, because law and econ, you know, what it can do basically is uh, suggest that this is better or that is better, but ultimately, ultimately uh, the choices that will be made are philosophical and political. Uh, but th the truth is that in writing this, uh, although this is framed very cl cleverly, um, it is just going back to uh, the works of another of the founding fathers of law and econ. His name is Guido Calabresi. Uh, he wrote a very, very famous book in the early 70s called The Cost of Accidents, 
and where he gave precisely this answer, right? So Guido famously in his, in his uh, very, very famous 19, I think it's 1972 book, he says, well, should we build a tunnel under the Mont Blanc? It looks like we should, because, you know, for that cost, it's going to generate an amazing benefit in terms of decreasing the cost for transporting merchandise and so on and so forth. It's beautiful. But, you know, maybe some people will die while constructing the tunnel, right? And so if the cost in lives is so short in comparison to the other benefits, does that by itself permits us to immediately and automatically conclude that the tunnel ought to be built? And the answer is no. The answer is no. There is a cost and there's going to be some political deliberation. The cost in lives, he meant, right? And uh, because, you know, people from a probabilistic standpoint, right, die in when, when uh, those... Um, uh, uh, constructions take place, especially with the the uh, techniques of those days. But what he meant really is accidents happen, right? But if the probability of accidents is so low, right, does that immediately justify the construction of the tunnel? And, and Guido answers it beautifully and correctly. He says, well, efficiency, efficiency is a consideration. It is important. It's just not the whole thing. And he's obviously right, okay? And so the reason I'm bringing this up is basically to say that the old question in normative law and econ has never been solved. The true meaning of efficiency in terms of providing a critique to law and econ and a path for improving the law, the true meaning of efficiency is questionable. Fair enough. Now, having, and this is all old, there's nothing new here. I'm just saying it's never gone. But there is also a new normative challenge, which is that of distribution. Okay. So the mainstream in law and econ, I took the time, I do that for my students here, I took the time of reading the, the beginning of the four uh, most famous textbooks in law and econ. And they are listed here. And I'm not going to read what they say, right? But basically what they say is law and econ is about efficiency in different ways, right? For instance, uh, this textbook, uh, uh, Bob Kuder and Tom Eulen, they say at, in the beginning of their textbook, they say, well, we, we redistributive goals, distribution, right? Should be used, should be, should be, should be uh, 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 done with taxes. You shouldn't tweak contract law, uh, tort law. You shouldn't tweak uh, uh, property law with a view to improving distribution, right? And so affordable housing, for example, forget it because it's part of property law. Uh, even if, right, affordable housing is questionable, by the way, right? But what about doing a little bit of affordable housing, right? What about, you know, there's this huge uh, uh, building, uh, I don't know, a thousand places. What about 10 affordable, right? Oh, well, the idea is it's still distorted, okay? I think it's not so simple. I think th the question is out there, whether you can do a uh, distribution on the cheap, on the cheap, if you do it on the margin, just a tiny bit. Of course, if you do it on the margin, also the results are not grandiose. But the point is, the point is that Tom Eulen and Bob Cooter, they teach in their textbook by saying, forget redistribution under private law, leave it for taxes. Of course, they're echo echoing um, a theory that was uh, dates back. Well, I'm not gonna be name dropping here, but you know, it, it's not their theory, uh, but they are building their textbook based on this theory, okay? And Bob, uh, Richard Posner does the same in his textbook, it says economic analysis of law, the basic, goal is that of maximizing efficiency uh, and, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth okay so the tradition of law and econ to sum up is dismissive of concerns with distribution it is basically all about all about efficiency okay but as it turns out as it turns out there is a wave of literature 
uh, the younger leading scholars in the field are saying that there is a distributive deficit in law and econ, and that law and econ should worry with distribution alongside efficiency. And so I'm quoting here, I'm just going to read it very quickly, two um, uh, uh, papers that have caused an impression upon me when I read them. And I'm like, hmm, okay, th there's something here. Perhaps, perhaps we should look at distribution alongside efficiency. These are clever papers. And I could list here many, many others that have writ been written in the same spirit, right? So the first one by uh, 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 Lee Fennell and uh, Richard McAdams called The Distributive Deficit in Law in Econ, uh, which says that attention to the reality of political action costs should mark an end to categorical, empirically unsupported advice against pursuing distributive objectives outside of the tax system. I'm still reading. Law and economics should attend not only to inefficiencies, but also to distributive deficits. The degree to which a given distribution fails to maximize welfare for a given total quantity of wealth, right? So what they're basically saying is distribution matters, efficiency matters. Uh, there are political costs of pursuing distribution through the tax system. You know, the tax uh, are, are um, not, uh, they are too regressive oftentimes. I, and by the way, I don't know that they are. Maybe they are, maybe they are not. I'm not totally sure about that. But in any case, right, they are saying, well, we should look at distribution. I think it's a reasonable point, but beyond my opinion, the point is it's increasingly gaining traction in the literature. There's a lot of people thinking about distribution who are writing in the tradition of law and econ. And this is really, really going against the, the tide, the tide of tradition in the field, okay? Another, another, another uh, uh, a very clever article written by Zachary Liskol is efficiency biased. And he says, I'm reading, quote, basing analysis on willingness to pay. I described it to you. I described to you his example, right? Building the playground in the wealthy or the poor uh, area, right? Where is willingness to pay bigger? Of course, in the rich area, right? And so if your goal is to maximize wealth, you're going to be further concentrating wealth. And so this is regressive. That's his point, right? So I'm going to read again. Quote, basing analysis on willingness to pay tilts policies towards benefiting the rich over the poor, since the rich tend to be willing to pay more due to their greater resources. Of course, right? And efficient policies without distribution of offsets are systematically regressive. So it's what I've just described to you. All right. So bottom line, normative questions. I think the paradigm is constantly being questioned in the literature. What about method? What about method? I want to distinguish here two questions. I want to distinguish here. I just want to make sure I'm not taking too much time. I want to distinguish here two questions. One, one is which economics and the other is what approach? What economic approach? So in terms of method, what economic analysis? I told you, microeconomics, right? M-I-C-R-O, microeconomics. And therefore, the study of supply and demand and equilibrium and incentives and prices and so on and so forth, right? However, so let me, let's read here. You see, in spite of its name, in spite of its name, right? It says law and econ. So you would think it's econ broadly understood, micro and macro and development economics and so on and so forth. But in spite of its name, the field is focused heavily on microeconomics beyond that, beyond that, beyond that. Law and economics is really a study of rational choice, or if you want, biased choice if you're thinking in behavioral terms. But the field is unconcerned with money and unconcerned with markets, at least the tradition, right? Of course, it's not always the case. Money, yes, a very, very secondary, uh, 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 even not, not even secondary, it's an 
it's not in the tradition, not in the literature almost, at least until 2008. And markets marginally, right? Antitrust, of course, is an exception where the tradition of law and econ talks about markets. Um, and in regulation, of course, but regulation is not, not the central piece in a, in a law and econ bottom line, okay? The tradition is unconcerned with money and markets. And the 2007 and 2008 uh, uh, debacle, right? Global debacle uh, showed the limitations of the existing paradigm. Oops. So let me start here. Let me start here. This is a, a, a groundbreaking book called Law and Macroeconomics. Okay. The thesis of which, by the way, I'm not really persuaded. I'm not really persuaded. I wrote uh, uh, um, a book review here uh, at, with the University of Toronto Law Journal, right? And, and it's mentioned here. Uh, but in any case, law and macroeconomics uh, uh, written by Yair Listokin basically says, you know, why are we limiting ourselves to thinking about microeconomics? Shouldn't we think about macroeconomics given that Given that uh, there are macroeconomic problems looming large uh, in in the uh, uh, here in the U.S. after two thousand and eight, right? That's you know with this methodological uh, claim, I agree completely, right? Why not think about macro, right? His he's applied argument. His applied argument is that if, if demand in the economy, aggregate demand in the economy or effective demand in the economy is faltering, then uh, the law should be tweaked to make people spend more money, right? And so that goes from, uh, from uh, forgiving that uh, to changing bankruptcy rules to uh, making regulation um, anti-cyclical and so you know the the requisites for allowing construction during a recession uh, go down whereas during good times they go up uh, and uh, and uh, making the budget uh, you know there's also I, I detail it in my critique obviously you should uh, read the book if you feel like it um, but the bottom line is there's a lot of people acknowledging the fact, right, that there are uh, challenges out there and there's no good reason why legal scholars should limit, limit themselves to thinking in terms of microeconomics, okay? I just want to mention uh, two pieces that I've published uh, recently on uh, on macroeconomic analysis of law, not because they are necessarily uh, the most representative, they're certainly not the best ones, uh, but they are, uh, they are uh, representative of the kind of literature that is coming up, right? There is uh, a, a recognition that many of the problems that we as a society face now cannot be adequately addressed uh, by microeconomics only. And at the same time, lawyers have something to say about their problems. And to do that, they should think in terms of macroeconomics. And what I have in mind, most obviously, are fields such as banking regulation and monetary regulation. Uh, the latter uh, topic that I've been teaching now, I'm now teaching a class uh, called uh, uh, Monetary Law and Regulation. But this is just detail. Uh, uh, I want to make the point that uh, a concern with macroeconomics is a, 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 uh, an attack on the existing paradigm of law and, if you will, micro economics okay another attack which is it, it perhaps it's it's less it's less an attack and more just a recognition of what is happening in the literature so mariana pergendler uh, my colleague at fgv 
uh, whose uh, class I don't know if you've already attended or you will attend, uh, but she's been documenting what she terms the relinquishment of quote unquote modularity in law and econ. And this is one of the papers where she talks about that. Okay. What is modul oops, what is modularity in law and econ? That's the term she she uses. Modularity. What does she mean by modularity? Well, she will say that the tradition of law and econ, that which would uh, be grounding the normalization of law and economics is modular, meaning that, meaning two things, okay? To say that the tradition in law and econ is modular, that the, therefore the normal science of law and econ is modular, means two things. The first thing it me is it means that there is a functional specialization in law and econ where each field focuses each field focuses on a specific problem right and so corporate law for example corporate law and economics employs agency theory agency theory employs agency theory to discuss how to maximize shareholder value, right? Even in financial institutions. So the goal is, the goal is to maximize shareholder value in corporations. And the tool to do that is, or the method, if you prefer, is agency theory, right? And so you apply agency theory to questions in uh, corporate law. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. So you will say, well, um, uh, managers, managers in corporations have a fiduciary duty, right? There's the duty of diligence, a duty of loyalty, and so on and so forth. They, are, they have fiduciary duty to the corporation, right? In other words, they have to ask, uh, to act in order to uh, uh, benefit the corporation, right? So that's, that's the idea. So, and to do that, they have to be diligent, thus the duty of diligence. And they have to be loyal, right? For example, you know, I'm a manager of a corporation and I come across an opportunity that can be uh, explored by the corporation which I manage, but I could personally, you know, just incorporate a business for me on the side or with my wife or with a friend and then seize it, the opportunity, and explore it myself, right? And that's a breach of the duty of loyalty, right? And so there is an explanation for the duty of loyalty, right? You need to incentivize uh, managers to act in the interest of the corporation to maximize shareholder profits and so on and so forth. And so you will explore corporate law from that angle. That's the tradition in corporate law. As it turns out, as it turns out, and this is what Mariana documents in her, in her work. Uh, corporate law also serves the purpose of doing stealth protectionism, right? And so governments in the real world, right? Not in the world of agency theory and models, but in the real world, governments worldwide, not the American government, every government mostly, uh, is constantly tweaking corporate law with a view to protect national incumbent, incumbents, uh, national champions, uh, fostering uh, strategic interests, and so on and so forth, right? And so the idea that there is such a thing, there's such a thing as the national interest, the strategic goals, the national planning, uh, the industrial policy, and so on and so forth, uh, they can be thought of economically. They are out there in the world. The politicians pay attention. Many economists pay attention, uh, but it's not part of the paradigm that informs the tradition of law and econ economics. Turns out this tradition is being questioned, right? Antitrust law, for example, that's another easy example, right? So, as I previously mentioned, uh, the tradition in antitrust law is that the goal 
is to maximize uh, consumers' welfare. But, but if you look at what's happening in antitrust law worldwide, I mean, it's been there for, for a long time for different reasons. Uh, but there are political concerns now uh, um, and uh, other types of concerns, other economic and political models that are uh, uh, increasingly influential, not only uh, in the minds of policymakers and legislators and commentators and public intellectuals or the, the average person walking by, but also, also making a dent uh, in the literature, okay? And this runs again, contrary to the prevailing paradigm, right? So there's all these tensions. There's all these tensions in the literature, right? It's you can no longer think of uh, the each each uh, field of law as having one goal, right? And so you know, corporate law maximize shareholder value, antitrust maximize consumer welfare, bankruptcy maximize uh, firm value for the benefit of creditors, contract uh, reduce transactions costs, and, and tort law reduce cost of action, so on and so on and so on. Right. So the all of that is coming under attack. Those ideas, right, that each field of law, when analyzed from the economic lenses, has one goal, uh, which, by the way, which, by the way, is efficiency. Right. So I said to you, I said to you, well, the modular, the modular uh, approach that characterizes the tradition of law in econ as described by Mariana, has two elements. One is this functional specialization, right? Bankruptcy law employs a method to attain a certain goal. Uh, corporate law employs a method to attain another goal. Tort law employs a method to attain a, a third goal, and so on and so forth, right? But ultimately, the overarching goal is always efficiency, right? Understood, again, uh, something like, you know, maybe people never really took too seriously the idea of wealth maximization. I think for a long time, people have not, but they are still, you know, welfareists or utilitarianists in some sense, they're weighing pros and cons. And it turns out uh, that in doing this uh, this uh, <clears throat> discussion about consequences, people are increasingly taking into account concerns beyond efficiency, at least narrowly understood as wealth maximization. Right. And so the field, right, maybe it would seem like we're moving towards, you know, this beautiful normalization where everybody's just looking at the applied and empirical questions. But it turns out that the methodological questions, it's not that they never went away. They're ever more present. It's not. I'm not saying, well, it's normalized, just not too much. I'm saying the opposite. It is in less normalized than it was 10 or 15 years ago, the field of law and econ. So it's not that we're moving towards normalization. Maybe we're not there yet. No, no, no. I'm saying precisely the opposite. It's much less normalized than it used to be. The theoretical controversies in the literature are way stronger now than they used to be. And I believe that the decisive factor was the coming about of, of, um, of the 2008 crisis, perhaps the ascent of China, perhaps a greater concern with globalization and, uh, and inequality in the US. I don't know, but uh, it's not normalizing. Fair enough? All right. Finally, that's my final point. Let's look at what the founding fathers, some of them at least, have been writing recently. And let me ask you that, are they jumping ship? In other words, are they doing the normal science that you know we would think that they are? So let's look at the, the grand master, the, the genius here, Richard Posner, right? My intellectual hero. Uh, he wrote two books. One in 2009 and one in 2010. The 2009 book, I think it's called The Crisis of Capitalism. The other one whose uh, uh, front page, uh, I mean, cover pages here depicted, it's called The Crisis of Capitalist Democracy. 
And just to get one representative quote among many, 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 many that you find in his uh, book, uh, uh, he says, the analysis in the quote, the analysis in this book and my prior one is based on Keynes' masterpiece, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, published in 1936. Now, as it turns out, the, uh, the focus on microeconomics, on rational expectations, on incentives at the uh, level of the individual, right? The so-called micro foundations, all of that, all of that is really, uh, 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 how could I say, completely at odds, uh, completely at odds with the method employed by Keynes, right? Let me just give you another way that is so illustrative to, to really explain the way, the way in which uh, uh, Richard Posner's, uh, you know, this books that he wrote, 10 years ago or so, how are, uh, just to give you a sense of how different they are from methodologically from the stuff he, he was writing 20 years earlier. You know, what is the normative goal for a Keynesian approach? It is that of maximizing a GDP, perhaps avoiding f f uh, fluctuations in GDP, Right? But in any case, the measuring rod is GDP, right? It's a concern with growth. It's a concern with employment. It's a concern with prices in the market. It's a concern with inflation. That's what Keynesianism is about. Um, Keynes, you know, I think jokingly, but, uh, you know, you find ideas such as, you know, in a downturn, right, where you have to uh, get uh, people to work, right? Uh, it, it could be okay to have them, you know, uh, 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 dig holes and then cover them up, right? It's better to do that uh, than to leave them at home. You know, if the government pays them a wage for them to dig holes and then cover them up, it's nice enough, right? Because in a Keynesian system of macroeconomics, my spending is your income, right? And so if I'm not spending, you don't have an income. And if I'm hoarding, if I'm saving, your income might be going down. And so we need, in a, when a effective demand goes down, right? When there's a crisis, you might need uh, to have people acting, pay attention to this, inefficiently in the microcosmos, right? In order to incite growth, GDP growth. So it's a completely different approach. Right. I think I speak about it more, more conceptually in the paper that I've just, um, in the two papers, by the way, that I've just uh, uh, added here to my presentation a couple of slides before. Uh, uh, what it means to talk, to do a macroeconomic analysis of law, and then I discuss these ideas. But uh, 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 the bottom line is, you know, the, uh, the, the, the most important scholar, the most important scholar in the tradition of law and econ is saying he's a Keynesian now. And so how can you, what kind of normalization are we, are we, are we uh, dealing with in law and econ? The answer is no normalization whatsoever. You see, the field is not normalizing. And here's another, a final one. I think this is my final slide, right? Cooter himself who 10 years ago wrote, oh, you know, we have these new techniques and the field is normalizing and we're going to focus, limit ourselves to focus on uh, applied questions and empirical questions, yada, 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 okay? And then he didn't publish it yet, uh, but the book is uh, available online, right? Called um, The Falcon's Geyer, Legal Foundations of Economic Innovation and Growth, right? And not to bore you with long quotes, okay? Let's look at the underlined part here. I, I mean, I, I like to read this because it's also poetic, right? So let's read the whole thing uh, and I'm gonna close my presentation. And then I'll just have a, another slide with conclusion. But this is the last thing I'm gonna say. So let's read, let's read what Bob says. He says, after years of parish work, a Catholic priest sat up in bed one morning and thought, Maybe the Pope is wrong and Buddha's right. 
uh, after years of teaching and writing about economic efficiency and the law, his writing, I sat up in bed one morning and thought, maybe efficiency is wrong and innovation is right. A new normative goal. We're going to focus now on innovation, not on efficiency, right? Uh, the effects on human welfare from inventing the tractor far exceed the effects from more efficient allocation of horses. Innovation causes compound growth that swamps static inefficiency like a tsunami swamps a skull. Uh, this fact compelled me to rethink previous work on law and economics, including my own. If this is not questioning the paradigm, then I don't know what is. And so let me conclude. There is an appearance of forward moving in law and econ. At closer look, law and econ has not and probably never will mature as normal science. And by the way, it's not normalizing at all. The theoretical disputes in the field are greater than they used to be. This is obviously, obviously not to deny the importance of conducting empirical work. That would be ludicrous. I'm not indicting empirical work. However, here's what I'm indicting. We need to caution against overselling law and econ's achievements. Thank you very much.